future PTAs. Hope you guys are doing well today. Today we're talking about repair of tissues. So the first portion of the lecture will be soft tissue and connective tissue repair, and then we will go on to joint um, and bone repair. So starting with soft tissue, um, some of the injuries, types of injuries people have that are considered soft tissue injuries are strains, sprains, dislocations, subluxations. All those are considered soft tissue injuries. A strain is an overstretching or an overexertion or an overuse of the soft tissue. It's frequent, frequently used to refer to uh, the musculotendinous unit that's injured um, versus a sprain is severe stress. It's a stretch or a tear to the soft tissue. Um, typically, it is referred to the li referring to the ligaments and it's graded on a first through third degree system. So a strain is overstretching. It's typically talking about a musculotendinous unit, so the tendon and where they join together. A sprain is typically talking about a ligament. It's measured from first degree to third degree, and it's more severe, more significant damage. Um, a dislocation is when a part has become displaced, it's not where it should be. And we're typically referring to bones when we're talking about uh, dislocations. Subluxation is an incomplete or partial dislocation, so a little less severe. And then muscle or tendon rupture or repair, I mean tear, rupture or tear, those words are <clears throat> uh, interchangeable. And those are also soft tissue injuries. With tendinous lesions, tendinopathy, that's a general term. It's an umbrella term for a tendon injury, and it's a, uh, affected by mechanical loading, by placing weight on that tendon. Then some of the categories under tendinopathy are tendinitis. Uh, no, I'm sorry, tenosynovitis. <laughs> um, tenosynovitis, and that's inflammation of the synovial membrane um, the covering of the tendon. Tenovaginitis is inflammation and thickening of the sheath around the tendon. Tendinitis is just inflammation of the tendon itself. It can cause scarring. It can cause calcium deposits. And then tendinosis is a degeneration of that tendon after you have repetitive microtrauma. So if you have tendinitis over time and don't really change what's causing the tendinitis, then you would develop tendinosis when the tendon begins to uh, break down. Um, the bottom picture here is the Simmons, Simons, Simon, sorry, test, where you have somebody lay in prone and their foot, if the Achilles tendon is connected, um, then their foot should be slightly plantar flexed. It shouldn't be resting in dorsiflexion. If it has ruptured, as in here, you can see that there's swelling in the area, a little bit of bruising. It looks completely, you can't see the definition of the ankle bones. Um, but their tendon, I mean, their foot will rest in more of a dorsiflex position. And then if you squeeze the gastroc, then it should make, if the Achilles tendon is attached, it should make the foot plantar flex more. If you squeeze it and there's no movement, then it's a positive uh, Simon's test where uh, the Achilles tendon is likely ruptured. So have them laying prone, squeeze the gastroc, see if there's movement of the foot. Some other soft tissue les uh, lesions. Synovitis is inflammation of the synovial membrane. Uh, right here, the kind of sac that surrounds the joint, synovial membrane. Uh, hemarth hemarthrosis, sorry, bleeding into the joint. And a ganglion or like ganglion cyst that you hear about are ballooning of the wall of a joint capsule or a tendon sheath. So right here is a ganglion cyst and it's a ballooning of that wall um, or the tendon sheath. Bursitis, inflammation of a bursa. So bursa are little sacs of fluid over bones that don't have a lot of tissues covering them so that if you get hit in that area, it doesn't go straight to the bone. It's kind of a protective portion. Um, and if those become inflamed, that's bursitis. Um, contusion is a bruise from direct blow or, or impact. And when a bruise happens, there have been capillaries that have ruptured 
and that leads to swelling and edema in the area, inflammatory response, and the bruise that you see. And then overuse syndromes, <clears throat> cumulative trauma disorders, repetitive strain injuries, are all due to repeated submaximal overload or frictional wear to a muscle tendon resulting in inflammation and pain. So any type of overuse syndrome or kind of a chronic damage is because there has been repetitively stress placed on that um, area that's causing inflammation and over time the inflammation begins to create an injury. Sorry about that. All right, clinical conditions resulting from soft tissue damage. Uh, dysfunction, joint dysfunction, contractures, adhesions, reflex muscle guarding, intrinsic muscle spasms, muscle weakness, myofascial compartment syndrome. So we will discuss some of these in a little bit more depth. Um, but it's kind of a reflex loop that you have... Um, Pain, that leads to muscle spasms, <clears throat> that restricts your movement, that decreases your blood flow, that leads to more pain, which means it's to more spasms, which means <laughs> leads to restricted movement. So any of those things can start the cycle. Trauma, pain, inflammation, infection, even emotional tension, stress, cold, being immobilized in a cast or anything can start this system but in order to break the cycle we have to step in it doesn't just break itself we have to go in and start doing soft tissue work massage uh, jo joint mobilizations uh, uh, modalities things like that to break the, the cycle injury severity we talked about the grades um, and with the grades remember we are primarily talking about sprains uh, which happen to the ligaments. So the different grades of tear, a grade one is first degree, and uh, that is mild pain at the time of injury and within the first 24 hours, and then increased pain with tissue stress. So what it's talking about tissue stress is when you lengthen that area and you're kind of pulling it apart, like you're stretching a rubber band, um, that's what it's talking about, increased stress. So if it was your bicep, if you straightened your arm out, and it pulled it to its lengthened state, that's when you're placing stress on that area. So a first degree um, injury would also cause pain when you do that. A second degree, you have moderate uh, pain that requires you to stop what you're doing at the time. You gotta stop and sit down or be taken out of the sport or whatever. And um, stress, like we talked about earlier, stretching on that area, pulling on both ends, and palpation, pushing on the area, both cause pain. So it's tender to palpation, just touching the area is tender. With a grade three, um, it is near, or third degree, it is near complete or complete tear, which is also called an avulsion, of the soft tissues, and that's severely painful when it happens. And then the stress to the tissue is typically painless because if I'm pulling on two ends of something, that aren't together. So let's say this. So before grade one or two, I'm pulling apart and there's something connected that is getting pulled on and getting irritated. Now that there's a grade three and it's completely torn, as I pull them apart, there's nothing left to add resistance to that motion and to cause pain with that motion. So it's less painful when you put stress on the area. Um, Sometimes you can feel when you palpate a bulge, like the muscle has kind of folded into itself and you can feel kind of a bulge there where it's been torn and uh, it will cause the joint to be instabil instable, unstable instability with the joint. If there's a ligament tear, if it's a muscle tear, there's probably some weakness there, significant weakness. Um, and uh, with the joint, it, it is unstable. It might be giving way, buckling, things like that. Stages of inflammation. So we're going to start with acute. That's usually the first four to six days. So we'll say less than a week um, versus the subacute is from about day 10 to 17. Um, sometimes it could be even two or three weeks after an injury, up to six at the most. The chronic stage is typically the um, six to 12 month portion. 
6 to 12 months is chronic stage. And then chronic pain syndrome is when it's greater than 6 months. And there's still pain even though the portion of the area that maybe there was an injury or surgery has already fully healed. And that would be chronic pain syndrome. There's still pain. There's not a clear cause because the area is healed appropriately and it's more than six months after the injury or the surgery. With acute inflammation, so first four to six days, the tissue response, there's inflammation, there's pain before tissue resistance. So it's painful to move and you don't usually get to end range. And we remember we call that pain is the limiting factor when we're documenting on range of motion. With uh, a cellular response, in the first 48 hours, there's exudation, or exudate is oozing at, at the injury site. There's phagocytosis, so there's phagocytosis means like eating of the particles, um, and it's the dead tissue is getting eaten away. And then there's early fibro fibroblastic, <laughs> fibroblastic formation, that's the scar. Um, so there's already a scar forming within the first two days. On a vascular level, during the acute inflammation stage, the blood clot begins to form, new capillary beds begin to form, and then chemicals are released, including histamine, bradykinin, prostaglandins, and they're all released to cause vasodilation, to allow the area to be provided with more blood. And more blood to the area makes that area warm, it makes it swollen, um, and it. the good thing is it brings more nutrients to the area that's what it's trying to do the bad thing is it doesn't have a shut off and say hey we've we've delivered enough let's give it a break it just keeps going and so sometimes that's why we really want to work and target the inflammation because when the fluid builds up there it actually decreases the ability to deliver new nutrients to the area some of the treatment considerations we need to take in mind when treating a patient with um uh, acute inflammation. We call this the protective phase. We want to be really careful that we don't cause more damage to a healing site. And we can education educate the patient on the RICE method, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Um, we can teach them on protecting the injured tissues, um, how to appropriately immobilize, how to really, um, you know, put on and take off their brace. Uh, how to do certain movements without affecting that limb, or if it's maybe a leg, how to walk without putting pressure on it. And then prevention of adverse effects of mobility. So if there's a way, there, you know, the surgeon has said they're allowed to take the brace off for this amount of time at a time, and they're allowed to let the arm dangle or to let the leg move a little bit on a supported surface or something like that, teaching them what they can and can't do to kind of... Um, decrease the effects of mobility. So um, this phase is basically the first week after a surgery or an injury, the protective phase. With the protective phase, some of the exercises that we might do, passive range of motion, very gentle joint mobilizations, gentle isometrics. We typically call those sets like glute sets, quad sets, things like that. Uh, we can put them in a shortened position and do some gentle massage, but you just have to be careful not to um, damage the healing breach. So what that means is there's two areas that have came together and formed a brand new scar and a brand new connection, and they're trying to heal, but they are very immature. They have very weak bonds, and it's very easily to break those apart. So if you're doing deep tissue work or... Um, aggressive anything you could damage that so that's why we have to be very gentle during this stage otherwise they would be starting the healing process all over um, intensity of movement it should not increase pain or inflammation remember a lot of these people start in pain but what you're doing should uh, not be significantly more painful uh, general movement in the neighboring segment state circulation lymphatic flow not flow. I'm sure you've seen this where somebody has a shoulder surgery. They have a ball that they're supposed to do squeezes. That's just to kind of help the blood flow and help that joint from uh, keep from getting tight. They may do some stretches or something to the neck, something like that. 
um, range of motion, resistance exercises, functional activities with assisted device, any of those things that are appropriate for that patient based on their injury and their um, surgery, if there was one, would be done in the protective phase. I put a picture of this. This is the pendulum. This is one of the things that we teach patients to do after a shoulder surgery to loosen this area up. It's not an active movement. They should move their body and the shoulder just swing along like a pendulum. And um, that can help increase their circulation and help them uh, have less pain and less tightness and things like that uh, in order to improve blood flow circulation. So with subacute inflammation, and if you notice I skipped a slide, there are some practice slides in here that we'll do in the lab, just so you know. With subacute inflammation, um, it begins, begins around day two to four, and it lasts for 10 to 17 days. It could last up to six weeks. Um, the younger you are, typically the faster you go through this process, the older you are, the longer it takes, and your general health greatly affects your ability to heal as well. And even, you know, the food you eat and um, how much you're moving, all that affects it. So tissue response. So it makes and deposits more collagen. Here we go back to collagen. We love some collagen. Capillary beds begin to form. Granulation tissue develops. So that's um, viable tissue that can heal and repair and, and put new tissue down. Collagen um, is um, going in place of the clot. Uh, so where the scar was, or the scab, I'm sorry, where the scab was, where the clot was formed, uh, collagen is starting to be placed there. It is weak and it's fragile during this time, so you have to be very careful. Uh, the wound typically takes five to eight days for uh, muscle or skin to close if it's just a wound that's um, the ends are touching each other. You know, if it's an open wound or the ends are separated, it might be different. And if the ends are approximated, they're touching each other, then it would take about five to eight days for the wound itself to close. And um, if it's muscle or skin, and if it is tendon or ligament, it typically takes three to six weeks. Um, Okay, just an explanation below of granulation tissue um, where new tissue is developing that is getting more nutrients and things like that. All right, some of the treatment considerations during our controlled motion phase. So we're in the subacute stage of inflammation and the treatment phase is considered the controlled motion phase. So we educate the patient, we teach them to limit excessive motions, we teach them to protect the area so they don't injure the collagen that's now weak and immature. We educate them on body mechanics, how to protect the area from that, and on pain and inflammation. And remember, this stage could last up to the first six weeks after an injury or a surgery. Sorry about that. All right, so uh, the things that we educate the patients on, we can also educate them on management of pain and inflammation. I might have said that, but I had to pause it for a minute. Control motion phase. This belongs to the subacute inflammation stage. And during the control motion phase, what exercises we do, we start to work towards active exercises. You start to increase the muscle angles, like diagonal planes and things like that. You start to do more Submaximal isometric exercises, so not maxing out, but doing more exercises against some resistance and things like that. Um, as we progress, we go from active assistive range of motion to active range of motion, from single plane to diagonal plane. And then with muscular endurance, we use that to offset atrophy of type 1 muscle fibers. Remember, those are the first to atrophy, first to be affected by immobilization or underuse. And then we go from active range of motion type things to low load, high rep exercises. Um, in the protected in protected weight bearing exercises, we can limit eccentric contraction to decrease strain on healing tissue. So even though eccentric contraction is the one that increases strength the quickest, 
It also is the most intense on the tissues themselves, and so eccentric contraction causes that lengthening and it causes that pulling, and if it's a healing muscle, then it's going to possibly pull too much and cause that area that's just now healing to break open. So eccentric strengthening needs to be limited. So um, that's not the focus during this controlled motion phase. Criteria for e exercise, we cannot start doing, especially not um, resistance training until the swelling has decreased, the pain is not constant, the pain's not exacerbated by motion as long as they're just going through their available range. All right, during the control motion uh, phase, um, so we start to stretch the muscle and we start progressing the stretches. Um, first, you want to warm the tissues up as always. Then do some relaxation techniques. This may include muscle, mo joint mobilization like those oscillations we talked about. Then the stretching techniques. You have to be very careful about stretching at this point because um, stretching is what's pulling on the muscle and you want to slowly build up how much tension it can withstand without doing any damage. Um, for the joint mobilizations, you can do grade three and four oscillations. You just got to be very careful. You got to do more of a sustained stretch and not the um, oscillations once you get into those deeper grades. With massage, I still would primarily focus on soft tissue work, so, you know, slowly, slowly progress into deep tissue work. Uh, we always want to use the range available so we don't lose range. And then we want to correct the contributing factors. Um, like muscle imbalances and things like that so that more damage doesn't occur. All right, with chronic inflammation, the tissue's response is at this point maturing and remodeling. The scar retraction is complete by day 21, so it's um, come together and it's formed that scar by day 21, but then the fibroblasts um, start to remodel around that time and so from day 21 to about day 60 so the first two months uh, the fibroblasts are remodeling so uh, the window of intervention means how long you have to really remodel those remember when scar tissues lay down it's just a random cluster of scar tissue and when you remodel you're stretching it and making it look more and lay down more and realign itself more like the tissues that surround it which makes it more mobile and act more like the tissues around it. But there's a 10-week cutoff time. If you don't do any scar mobility, if you don't do any active motion or anything like that, during the first 10 weeks after an injury, you are really going to have some intense scar tissue that is now mature and not able to realign and uh, be uh, remodeled into a better usable form. Um, so after 14 weeks is when it becomes unresponsive to remodeling and poorly stretches and it has more tensile force. So it becomes stronger because it's more mature, but it resists changes. So you cannot really help. So if somebody has a scar that's very deep and very adhered to the surfaces below and it's been more than 14 weeks um, after the injury, then uh, there's very little <laughs> help for that scar. Um, when the scar matures, the collagen strength increases, and as the tissues remodel, uh, the collagen orientation also increases. Uh, this is the re-injury cycle. We talked about it earlier. There's pain, so you restrict the movement. Then you become deconditioned. The muscles, the joints, the circulation, all our circulations decrease. The joints are stressed. The muscles are tight. And then that puts you at risk for compensatory patterns. So you're doing movements in a strange pattern that are actually overstressing some areas and underusing others. Uh, sets up a muscle imbalance. That creates an overuse injury. Certain muscles are the ones taking over and they're hurting and um, becoming more and more tight. And that leads to more pain and the cycle continues. Um, so, uh, okay, we talked about that. 
So you use it too much, there's trauma, then you re-injure an old scar, you become more mobile, you lead to false, <laughs> false depostures, faulty postures, etc., etc. All right, with recurrent microtrauma and leading to chronic pain, uh, the tissue response, there's chronic inflammation. Remember, inflammation tries to bring things to the area for healing, but once it sits in there for a long time, it means that the bad things that are needing to get out of the area are kind of just hanging out in there. And the good nutrients that are trying to get to the area don't have really room to go because there's already something taking up that space. So uh, that process is perpetuated and it becomes more of a damage to the tissues than a help. Um, but causes a weakening effect. This whole lecture, I've had people <laughs> texting and calling. I'm sorry. Um, the collagen starts to degenerate. The fibers start to thin. The um, cells, uh, hypercellularity is an abnormal ex excess of cells, and that happens to the tendons. So you can get like a thickened tendon. And then scattered vascular growth, and that uh, happens in the tendons as well. There's more... Um, Ooh, blood. blood to the tendons, I'm sorry. And your movement is limited. This is all in the chronic inflammation stage. Some of the contributing factors. I mentioned this earlier, but muscle imbalances when one side's too strong and the other's weak. Rapid or excessive repeated eccentric demands. Those are hard on the joints. Muscle weakness, bone malalignment or weak structural support. Sudden changes in the activity or intensity or, or demands. Um, if you're progressing too quickly, if you're pushing yourself too hard, too fast, um, returning to an activity too soon, you haven't given it enough time to heal, sustained awkward postures or motions. If you're constantly in a weird position, whether it's for a job or because you're training poorly or something like that, environmental factors can affect it, age-related factors, things that muscle strength or collagen decreasing with age, and training errors. All those lead to chronic inflammation and um, injury. All right, so progress in the chronic stage. So the collagen becomes more oriented and the strength increases as long as you're kind of putting a little bit of tension on it and you are kind of doing things to restructure it. Uh, the wound size decreases. The remodeling of the tissue occurs because there are a weakening of the hydrogen bonds, which allows uh, kind of the binding part that's just heaping them in a clump to release so that they can now be moved and realigned. Um, this, again, is allowed for up to like 10 weeks, and remodeling may take up to 10 weeks, but after week 14, there's very little remodeling that happens. Um, yeah, and you may need to do it longer after a certain surgery, but again, after 14 weeks, we don't see a lot of remodeling. Treatment considerations with the chronic inflammation stage. That can be, uh, chronic inflammation can be separated into categories. And one of them we call acute on chronic, meaning you have a chronic condition, but now there's a flare up of that. So we call it acute on chronic. Now there's more inflammation in an area that stays inflamed. Um, and during this stage, we want to work on controlling the inflammation, decrease the acute, acute inflammation so that we uh, keep the tissues from breaking down and more scar tissue developing. And then you want to also determine what is the irritating factor? What can I target and decrease in order to um, decrease the inflammation, the irritation, muscle balances, things like that. Uh, during the subacute and chronic stages of chronic inflammation, so chronic chronic inflammation or subacute chronic inflammation, a lot of times you just see it listed as chronic inflammation. Um, we want to do scar mobilization, uh, friction massage is one way, soft tissue manipulation, stretching techniques, all to realign the collagen, um, active range of motion and strengthening exercises, mainly focusing on stability of the joint and um, decreasing the muscle imbalances. Here are some ways that we do um, scar mobilization, by the way. You can do up and down, side to side, or circular patterns to decrease the tension on that scar um, or the adherence to the structures beneath. And then other exercise we can do, endurance exercises, keeping them from getting tired quickly, and then work hardening, work conditioning, specific skills that they need to be able to do to return to their job 
and doing those for longer and longer durations. Treatment considerations to return to function. So patient education, you want to teach them how to safely stretch, teach them how, what signs to look for for excessive stress, teach them about proper body mechanics and good form with exercises, um, teach them what to uh, look at before they progress. You need to be able to do this many of an exercise or you need to be able to do it with this form before you progress. Um, you need to mm -hmm. safely progress their stretching and their muscle performance and really monitor that as they're doing it. Um, start working on multi-angle isometrics and then eventually get to dynamic exercises, dyna dynamic resistance training. Start with isolated one direction movements and then eventually go to more complex multi-directional movements. Um, slowly return to their high demand activities and determine, you know, what do they need to be able to do for function and target that. For their functional needs, they need to be able to do this and that and progress towards those. All right. Um, so we will work on some of this in lab, the patient scenarios I'm skipping through. And uh, we'll go on to joint and bone injury. So the roadmap is right here of the things that we're about to cover. First is osteoarthritis. So there's a difference between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. And here are some pictures that show this is a normal joint here. Osteoarthritis, basically the ends of the joint have become um, like callus. There's some, uh, some uh, bone to bone. So the cartilage has worn down. So the bone has gotten closer together. The cartilage is worn down and there's less of a cushion between the bones so the bones are rubbing on each other and kind of wearing each other down versus rheumatoid arthritis is more of an inflammatory process where the joint is staying inflamed like that chronic inflammation and um, that inflammation over time is starting to wear down the bone remember when all that stuff sits around an area the tissues that it are just sitting in that constant toxic fluid will say wear down whether it's muscle bone any of that starts to wear down and get weaker and weaker so um we'll talk a little more about osteoporosis now with uh, osteoporosis is that what i called it at first arthritis arthritis <laughs> rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disorder it's characterized by chronic inflammation of the joint lining that's the synovium that we saw in that picture and it causes bone erosion and eventually bone deformities joint deformities um, some of the signs and periods, there's or symptoms, periods of active disease and periods of exacerbation. There's joint pain and stiffness. There's deformities after they've had it for a while. Um, and because this is an autoimmune disease, what you do to the overall health, the overall system of that person greatly affects their inflammation or swelling of their joints. So their diet, the amount of sleep they get, the quality of sleep they get, and other systemic factors affect their symptoms greatly. So if they are eating right, sleeping right, um, avoiding toxins and other things, then it may decrease. And the moment they eat sugar, they may get a flare-up. Um, some of the treatment considerations, we want to educate the patient. We want to protect the joint and modify activities to teach them how they can do them in a safer way. Um, Flexibility and gentle stretching can help uh, continue to progress mobility or maintain the mobility they have. Uh, we want to do some joint mobility. We can do some cardiopulmonary endurance training, and then we can do some functional training. Um, we don't want to overstretch the joints um, with somebody who already has rheumatoid arthritis because that will exacerbate their symptoms. With osteoarthritis, this is also known as degenerative joint disease. And most of the time when people just say they have arthritis or arthur, <laughs> um, they're talking about osteoarthritis. So it's caused by wear and tear. Over time, the cartilage begins to erode, and that's the cushion between the bones. And then you have bone-on-bone -bone interaction. Bone spurs can develop, so little like thorns that grow onto the bone. Um, causes pain and stiffness, especially in the mornings. 
or after sitting for a long time. So you see somebody get up in the first few steps, they're really stiff and then they start to loosen up. That's probably some arthritis. Um, light activity is very helpful in these patients because it lubricates the joints. It de decreases their stress, sorry, pain and stiffness. Um, but heavy exercises like uh, high impact jumping, things like that, exacerbate their symptoms. So you would want to avoid those um types of movements a lot of patients with osteoarthritis also notice changes in their pain with changes in the weather like atmospheric pressure cold wet rainy days they notice it's worse treatment considerations for someone who has osteoarthritis you want to instruct them you want to work towards decreasing their pain you want to work towards training them on proper use of assistive devices or supporting devices um, they can do some light resistance training, some stretching and joint mobilization, some balance, some aerobic conditioning. Um, in most patients who have osteoarthritis, they hate ice. It really doesn't help the type of inflammation they have, so it's not really beneficial. And it's painful, typically. It typically makes their symptoms a little bit worse, um, as opposed to other chronic inflammation or any type of inflammation disorder. All right, fibromyalgia versus myofascial pain syndrome. Okay, so with um, both conditions, there's pain in the muscles, there's decreased range of motion, and there's postural stresses. There's certain areas that hurt worse and certain positions that hurt worse. With fibromyalgia, however, there's tender points. So this is a picture of the different tender points. And typically, to be diagnosed with um, fibromyalgia, you... Uh, should be tender in like 8 out of 12 of these tender points. Um, there's not a referred pattern. So if I push here, it hurts there. Where I'm pushing, it does not shoot pain anywhere else. Uh, there's not a tight band of muscle. You push on an area, it doesn't feel tight. It doesn't feel like there's a knot there, but it still causes the patient pain. They have fatigue and they wake up feeling unrefreshed. Versus with myofascial pain syndrome, there are trigger points in the muscles, so you push on one area, it refers pain to a different area, you feel tightness in that area, it gives you kind of something to work on as far as manual therapy, but there's not related fatigue or um, waking up feeling unrefreshed, that's the difference between the two. With fibromyalgia, it's an autoimmune disease. It's typically diagnosed by ruling out other autoimmune diseases with similar symptoms. 12 of the 18, okay, I was wrong. 12 of the 18 tender points must be present along with muscle pain and fatigue in order to fit that diagnosis. So at least 12 of those 18 tender points are present. There's pain and there is fatigue. Fatigue. <laughs> Um, some medical doctors are not fully convinced that fibromyalgia is a real thing. They kind of blow it off. Uh, the patient who has it is fully convinced. Um, so my recommendation to you is when somebody tells you, you they're in pain, believe it until proven otherwise. Kind of like somebody's innocent until proven guilty. Believe what they say. You don't really know. You can't feel what they're feeling. And just because their symptoms don't match, you know, this or that doesn't mean it's not real. So I recommend believing the patient's. Um, oftentimes patients with fibromyalgia, uh, only tolerate light pressure. So manual therapy, be very careful. Deep pressure can actually set them back. They might be sore for days from a deep tissue massage. So be very careful with that. With myofascial pain sy syndrome, this is chronic pain disorder. It's related to myofascial restrictions. They increase pressure on the surrounding structures and they cause refer pain. Uh, patients with this typically respond well to PT because we have a lot of treatments that target myofascial uh, pain and tightness. So manual therapy is great. Dry needling, cupping is great. Um, stretching is good. Uh, you want to correct the muscle imbalances and the training errors that led to that uh, pressure and um, tightness in the first place. And then there are some modalities you can use, such as ultrasound, that can help with um, myofascial pain. <laughs> I had that same sentence about, um, about fibromyalgia. One other point I was going to make about fibromyalgia is they're typically sensitive to cold as well. 
All right, with osteoporosis, um, there's such a thing as primary and secondary osteoporosis. We'll go into in a minute. For prevention, you want to maintain a balanced diet, weight-bearing exercises, because weight-bearing stimulates the calcium reabsorption by the bones. If you're not weight-bearing, then the calcium is lost more quickly. A healthy lifestyle, so you want to limit your alcohol consumption. You want to avoid smoking. All that is important because those things can decrease your bone density. With primary osteoporosis, um, that's caused by factors that you cannot help um, and a direct connection with your genetics. So it could be people who are postmenopausal for every um, year that you do not have a menstrual cycle, whether it's because of menopause or because of a menstruation, like if maybe you're anorexic or something and are, don't have enough body fat to produce a menstrual cycle, your, in, your likelihood of having osteoporosis increases because your bone density is decreased. If you're Caucasian or Asian descent, uh, you're more likely to get a family history of osteoporosis, low body weight, low or no activity, low calcium and vitamin D in the diet, smoking, prolonged bed rest, or advanced age. All those can lead to primary osteoporosis. With secondary osteoporosis, there's another primary condition, such as like a GI disease or hyperthyroidism or chronic renal failure or alcoholism, and then even medical side effects of medication like glucocorticoids. And then those conditions are causing you to decrease the absorption of your um, vitamin D and calcium and therefore causing the bones to become more brittle and more thin. Treatment considerations. Um, for aerobic exercise, it's recommended to do five or more days per week, 20 to 30 minutes, kind of what is recommended for general population. With resistance training, you want to do low resistance, but it is recommended to do two or three times a week and to do exercises that you can do eight to 12 reps per muscle group. So we don't want to go extremely hard, but that resistance and the tension on the um, bones can help increase the absorption of calcium. Precautions and contraindications. You do not want to do significant spine flexion or rotation already that are they're at a higher risk of fracturing their vertebrae and those positions put them at an even higher risk. And you want to really slowly increase the resistance exercises um, so that you do not put excessive pressure on a bone and then cause uh, more damage than you are help. With the bone anatomy, okay, so just going on to some bone injuries. There is the physis, which is our growth plate. There is the epiphyseal um, area, which is closer to the end of the bone, and there's the metaphyseal area, which is closer to the middle of the bone. If you were to fracture your physis, or your growth plate, it could stunt your growth, at least in that extremity. Different types of fractures. A displaced fracture is one that causes the bone to move from its original position. And if it is displaced, then realignment is needed in order to heal properly. So if it's not displaced, you may be able to go without a cast, maybe just wearing a brace or just not using that area as much, but it, if it is displaced, they may have to do surgery or they may have to um, reposition the bone and then put a cast on or something like that in order to get it to heal appropriately. And these are different types of fractures that you can have. And some more fractures you can have as well and this is just kind of for your information and these um, types of fractures are listed below as well wedge com uh, two to three segment um, or a crush injury injury or comminuted, comminuted. Um, that means it has two more than two segments Risk factors for fractures if you have repetitive stress if you have a bone disease or Something like that, if there's been a sudden impact like car accident, abuse, assault, osteoporosis, which is more likely in women than men, if there's been a history of falls, so if your age is high, low BMI, low levels of physical activity all lead to high risk of falls, and those can all re lead to fractures. I'm having trouble reading today. 
ca uh, cancellous versus cortical bone. So cancellous bone is closer to the ends, cortical bone. Uh, oh, sorry. Cancellous is the spongy bone in the middle, and cortical bone is the hard bone uh, around the edges. Um, so it's uh, the inner surface of the long bone is cancellous bone, and then the compact or hard bone around the surface is cortical. Uh, for cortical bone healing, um, these are the stages. So first, there's an infl inflammation stage where it bleeds inside of the bone. And then there's a, a reparative phase where there is a callus that forms. Uh, then the remodeling stage. And this um, is when the bone actually is considered clinical union, where it actually comes together. Uh, where, where the fracture is firm enough to no longer move, um, but it's still very at high risk for injury if because it's not mature yet. Um, so it's also the stage of radiological injury. What, that's where it's been replaced by mature bone. So as it's remodeling, there's one point where the bones no longer move, and there's another point where it's replaced by mature bone where it can actually handle more stress and tension. And then uh, rigid internal fixation occurs. The healing time of a bone uh, depends on your age, location, type of fracture, displacement, if there was surgery or not, if there's any soft tissue injury or not, if you smoke tobacco because that constricts your arteries, um, if there's good blood supply to the bone, all those things. In children, typically uh, healing time is four to six weeks. In adolescents, it's about 6 to 8. In adults, it's usually 10 to 18 weeks. Cancellous bone, um, more towards the center. It's more susceptible to compression fractures. You know, it's more porous, so it's more likely to get compressed that way. Um, it heals quickly unless the two surfaces are pulled apart. If the epiphyseal, epiphyseal plate or the growth plate is damaged, it could stunt the growth. And the prognosis of bone healing is all related to the injury, the age of the patient, the blood supply, the method of reduction. That means how they um, got the bones to come back together. And if it was a closed versus open injury, so closed is where it did not, the skin was not torn. It was just within the body part. Open is uh, there's been some type of damage to the skin and there's, it is, open to the surrounding and it's more likely to get infected things like that immobilization we've talked about this before the local tissue impairments that occur during immobilization that the connective tissue gets weaker there's a degeneration of articular cartilage your muscles atrophy contractures can develop and the slow the circulation slows down to that area uh, general impairments, there's decreased range of motion and joint play, muscle atrophy and weakness, initial pain with move it, movement, and inelastic scar formation with soft tissue damage. With a fracture, um, if somebody's immobilized in bed, uh, you could do something to help them minimize the effects of the immobility like some bed exercises some rolling some just active range of motion anything to get them moving a little bit to decrease the effects of immobilization with the functional adaptation so this we teach uh, proper assisted device use transfers other functional skills um, that the patient is having trouble with make sure you're taking into consideration the weight bearing precautions which will be in their medical chart the medical doctor will decide that and you teach what they need to learn in order to move around without putting weight on or to use their assistive device appropriately um, some other treatment ideas um, for someone after they have either gotten out of the cast or began to do go through other stages of therapy Joint mobilization, you can mobilize the surrounding joints if they're still in a cast. PNF stretching, functional activities, muscle strengthening, and then scar tissue mobilization. So this has been kind of an overview of soft tissue, connective tissue. Um, uh, what was the other? <laughs> soft tissue, connective tissue, this one. 
joint and bone injuries. <laughs> if you have questions, please let me know.